welcome you to the Latino Leaders Issue Hour. I'm Mickey Ibarra. This is one of our signature events of the Latino Leaders Network, a nonprofit organization that we formed last September to really host this event, our luncheon, which follows at uh, noon today, actually a, a pre-luncheon reception at 11.30. We also host the Latino Mayor's Dinner in connection with the U.S. Conference of Mayors twice a year, both their winter meeting here in Washington, D.C., and around the country. As the Latino Leaders Network prepares to honor one of our own actress, Eva Longoria, of the Emmy Award-winning show we all know and love, Desperate Housewives, we wanted to take this opportunity to address an issue of importance to, I think, all of us, and that's how it is that we expand the opportunity for Latinos in the entertainment industry. Eva Longoria has made major strides, I think, for all of us in the industry, but where are we today? And how far have we come and where are we, where are we headed? We have put together an excellent panel of experts, all of them right here with us, all from Hollywood. I'm reminded that, you know, I'm, I'm, Washington, D.C. is often described as Hollywood for ugly people. <laughs> <laughs> so we brought, <laughs> we brought in our panel from Hollywood, okay? <laughs> to really explore these questions, to kind of give a sense of, of where we're at in the entertainment. I want to present the moderator of today's panel, our associate at Mickey Barra and Associates, David Ramirez. David focuses on representing our entertainment and telecommunication clients, including CTV, the first English language Latino themed network in the nation, and also the National Hispanic Media Coalition that is headed by Alex Nogales. David Ramirez, prior to joining Mickey Barra and Associates, he served as the legislative assistant for Congressman Joe Baca. In that capacity, he managed media, telecommunications, international affairs, veterans, and child safety, and served as liaison for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus for the Congressman. As chair of the CHC's Corporate America Task Force, Con Congressman Baca tasked David with creating a platform to advocate for increased participation of Latinos in corporate America. In 2004, this task force witnessed its first successful venture as actors, scholars, and executives were brought together to study the minority representation gap in the media and entertainment industry. I'm very, very proud to have David Ramirez as a member of our firm, and I'll turn it to him now to moderate this panel. David? Thank you, Mickey. I, I appreciate um, being given the opportunity to moderate this, uh, this panel of impressive uh, experts today from uh, Hollywood, as you said. And I also want to reiterate Mickey's comments um, about Walt Disney and ABC, who are our sponsors today. Uh, increased representation of Latinos has been a priority of ABC, and the role in today's event demonstrates their commitment to our community. So I'd like to invite Bob Mendez, who is Senior Vice President of Diversity, who will say a few words on behalf of our sponsor. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very, very much uh, for inviting us to be here. It's an honor for us to have the opportunity to sponsor this event, this very important event. And uh, for me, it's just always an, a great opportunity to come back to D.C. and have a chance to meet you know, such influential folks. So thank you for all of that. At the company, we really do believe and, and, and do business by a very fundamental but important principle, and that's that diversity makes us a better company. And we didn't get there all by ourselves. That uh, Getting to that place uh, was in partnership with folks like Alex Nogales, who really helped us to understand that diversity was fundamental to our being able to do business and be competitive on a global basis. And uh, we're fortunate to be able to, to look at, at very specific examples of success that tell us that diversity works. 
and uh, you know, we're, whether it's Desperate Housewives or Lost or Grey's Anatomy, Ugly Betty, George Lopez, uh, over on, on the channel side, the Cheetah Girls, Handy Manny, there is a real uh, recognition of the fact that we can be the leaders in our industry if we embrace diversity, because embracing diversity means that the programming is textured, it's real, it's authentic, and ultimately it's more entertaining. And people will watch. And we're in the business of getting people to watch our television shows. Uh, most recently, we're thrilled to have hired our first Latino uh, advertising agency of record, the Arenas Agency. And they were very instrumental in the launch of Ugly Betty. Uh, Betty has proven to be a success of extraordinary proportions. Uh, she's new, she's different. And to handle Betty the way that, that we did, it was important to have a Latino agency who understood Betty. And so for us, uh, I'm just thrilled to work at a company that is beginning to get it. Uh, I think that you know we've got a long way to go. Alex is always there to remind us that we can do better. Uh, but, it, but from my point of view, uh, I really do uh, want to thank you all for, for inviting us to be here. And uh, I encourage you to watch our shows. It's, it's really important uh, to watch. You know, uh, part of, I think, that there's a responsibility for us as programmers to put it on the air. And if it's the kind of programming that you want to see, then let people know you're watching. So with that, uh, thank you again for, for this invitation to be here, and hope you have a successful uh, Issues Hour. Thank you. <laughs> Bob, and thank you to ABC and Walt Disney again. Our uh, first panelist, as Mickey had mentioned before, is the president and CEO of the National Hispanic Media Coalition, uh, Mr. Alex Nogales. He obtained a degree in film and television from UCLA and began his career as a writer for bicultural children's television, which produced the Emmy-winning children's program, Via Alegre. As writer and producer, Alex also earned three Emmy awards for such shows as At Issue, Troubleshooter, and Kid Quiz. His success has afforded him the opportunity to fight against the exclusion of American Latinos from television, radio, and film. Elected president of the Media Coalition in the late 90s, he also led boycotts against advertisers of the Howard Stern Show to get Stern off the air when he offended the Latino community and the family of Selena through his offensive comments about her. As one of the more visible organizations under the umbrella of the Latino, National Latino Media Council, excuse me, Alex was instrumental in the signing of Memoranda of Understanding with NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, and in, 2000, uh, and in 2003, excuse me, with Time Warner. Under the Media Council's umbrella, Alex engaged Nielsen Media Research on his rating practices, leading to a $50 million commitment by Nielsen to improve operator training for their measuring equipment. Currently, he is evaluating the diversity performance of the four major networks, pushing for diversity initiatives in the public policy arena, and taking on entities that continue to take advantage of the Latino immigrant population for their own personal gain. At the same time, he continues to do what he always loves to do, and that's open doors for Latino professionals in all media areas. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my good friend, Mr. Alex Nogales. Thank you again, David. You know, in 1989, something very significant happened, and that is that the Los Angeles Times wrote a, an article talking about the fact that out of the 24 new shows that were coming on the air that, that fall, not one of them had a person of color as a regular. Re regular meaning that the person is in every one of the programs that is produced weekly. <clears throat> not an Asian Pacific American, certainly not a Native American, not an African American, and not a Latino as well. This galvanized the Latino community as nothing had before. We all flew to DC here, and we met the National Council of La Raza headquarters, and we agreed that this was something that we had to work on as a large coalition. In very quick order, um, you will remember that uh, Kwaizi Mafumi of the NAACP was also saying the same things as we were saying. We met in Baltimore, and we brought in our Asian Pacific American allies as well as our Native American allies, and there were something like 30 or 40 of us that flew in. And we agreed that this larger coalition had to do the work. In quick order, we got appointments with ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, and over a two-year period, we signed memorandums of understanding that were to integrate their workforce both in front and in back of camera, 
to include it, not only that, but also procurement, to include as well governance, to include everything that the business was. Um, the numbers, as you might well expect, were terrible at that time. Um, Latinos as regulars were two at one network, three at another one. It was like that. Um, writers were non-existent at two of the uh, two of the networks. Latino writers, I'm talking about. So we had a lot to overcome, and you know we had to threaten ABC with a boycott. I had led a boycott a few years previous to that. They had never forgotten that, so I wasn't someone that they really wanted to have there. But you know, to their credit, they turned it around, and it happened because of one guy by the name of Alex Wallow, who saw it, who said, this is right, and we need to do this. And now they are the most successful of all the networks, as you know. When it comes to Latinos watching their networks, they're right there. And the reason for that is because, you know, they're, we're a demographic that everybody wants right now. We're numerous, we have children, a lot of children, and they're in the right age group that they want, that everybody wants. So as Alex is, is very good about saying, they became number one when they started embracing diversity. So to their credit, Bob, and you can carry that back, I know that you and I have discussed this on numerous occasions. Um, we have been evaluating the network's performance and diversity for the last several years. Every year we do at least, at least two visits to the networks to get their numbers in terms of actors, writers, producers, directors, anything having to do with their performance and diversity to include procurement, which is very important to us, and uh, because there's millions upon millions of dollars across hands there, and we have a lot of entrepreneurs that just need you know, those doors to open so they can sell their products. And their products can be anything from tablecloths to chairs and to pencils and everything else. And if you have enough of those pencils and so forth that you're selling, you can make a very good living. In any case, um, earlier this year, you, you heard the papers, you read the papers saying that diversity was down at the networks. The numbers do not say that at all. Just the opposite. The numbers continue to go up. They're headed, of course, by ABC, but the rest are not doing badly either. Uh, CBS is right there, so is uh, NBC, and so is now Fox. So, you know, sometimes the papers like to sensationalize things and say things that aren't quite so. Or perhaps they, they pertain to one specific ethnic group. When it comes to Native Americans, they all fail across the board. You know, when you look at how many Native Americans there are in front of camera, how many writers, directors, and so forth, they're all, they should all be ashamed of themselves. They all have initiatives, but at a certain point, as I'm very fond of saying to everyone, initiatives are great, but unless there are jobs that you can put down to a column, it means absolutely nothing. And they've all had enough time now to show performance in that area for Native Americans. Remember that when you scratch a Mexican, you're going to get a Native American. So it's that close of a connection, and we're very, very sympathetic. And he's saying, OK, over there, over there because he's Native American. <laughs> um, where we are right now, the numbers are much better than, than they have been for a very long period of time. And they're all competing now with ABC to bring in that audience. Nielsen has a great deal to do with it. Are Latinos watching? Are there enough English language Latinos that are turning the dial? We're going to get that from Monica. I'm not going to attack Nielsen today. I, I, uh, you know, we're trying to make our peace, and Monica is, as you know, was hired as a consequence of all the noise that we made over there. But she's a good ally, and she means well, and she's pushing from internal, and we have to keep the pressure on them externally. So it isn't, you know, I don't like her, she doesn't like me. I mean, we even had lunch the other day. I mean, we're good friends. And she's an attractive woman besides, you know. Um, but it isn't just about that, guys. It is about much more. And that is, there's going to be a new telecommunications law that is going to come into effect next year. And we have to be at the table. A lot of the propositions that are being put out there, legis legislative agendas, don't favor us. Do not favor us. And we have to insist on the same things that we insist on the networks in terms of that telecommunications law. Because if diversity doesn't exist there, we're being locked out out of something that's going to affect us for decades. Not for years, decades. Because we're going to have to live with the outcome of that. Now, fortunately for us, it's a new administration which is more sympathetic to us, that is more willing to listen to us, more willing to investigate to see what the real facts are. 
so that, in fact, we have legislation that is going to be favorable. And we need it to be favorable in the, in the uh, areas of employment, in the areas of governance, in the areas of um, um, corporate giving. Uh, we need them to be generous and open in terms of media ownership. If we don't own media ship, if we don't have some of those properties that we can exercise, we're going to be locked out. So having ownership for Latinos and other people of color is of the utmost importance. We've got to have the ability to get in there and own our own properties. Um, I could go on more in this vein, but I think it would be redundant. I'm going to turn it on to the next speaker because she has a great deal to say on an area that is a particular concern to us, and that's the Nielsen ratings. As you know, Fox has made the peace with Nielsen, and that's great. But I asked her and I asked Fox the other day, what did we win? You know, we, everybody says we won. What did we win? Well, the, Nielsen is putting out $50 million to train their personnel so that they can better count people that are out there as uh, Nielsen households. But I want to know more. You know, what does the sample group look like? Are they really assembling the correct number of Latinos in Spanish and in English to, in fact, get a good reading as to what we're watching? At this point, I don't care what, you know, whether we're English or Spanish. It doesn't matter. We're the same people. So, you know, I said that was uh, one more thing that I was going to say, but there is one more thing that bothers me, and I hope it bothers you too. Mel Gibson just came up with a film, hasn't, uh, hasn't aired, Apocalypto. Um, the film promises to be a brilliant one. I saw the, the previews on it, and as you, um, you know, I can't wait to see the film. The filmmaker, however, has been on record as being a very bigoted individual, not by one source or two or three, by a lot of different sources. So we have to believe that at a certain point that we're dealing with a person here that, that has those type of bigoted uh, tendencies. I will remind all of you that our community is under attack, that every bigot and racist that is out there that wants to get into the immigration debate has gotten into the debate and is hurting all of us documented or undocumented. Remember that people can't tell the difference who is who. And if you look at some of the data that is coming out, hate crimes against Latinos is sky high and climbing. So they're giving me the one minute. I, I will get off in a second here. It is, it is climbing. We cannot be seduced, guys, into giving awards to Mel Gibson any more than we can appreciate <clears throat> someone else being a bigot towards us. Um, we can applaud the film. Certainly we can do that. We can say it's a brilliant film. But we have to restrain ourselves when it comes to the individual. I don't like it when people come at us. And I hate it when somebody gives them an award for coming at us. And we... If it, even though it's not directed against us, you know that it's directed against the Jews. According to him, they started World War II, you know. So to me, it's very clear that if we don't want people being prejudicial towards us, we should not be applauding someone who is prejudicial against another group because it's one and the same thing. It's racism, it's bigotry, and we shouldn't applaud it. We shouldn't get out there and, and as a group did just recently, give them the Visionary Award. So restrain yourselves uh, in terms of that because it's not something that we can be proud of. It is not something that is going to help our cause. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, as I read your bio and get to know a little bit more about you, I'm. Uh, and reading about the boycotts and uh, the pressure that Alex put on different companies. I'm uh, personally glad that I work with Alex instead of against him. So, thank you. Um, our next panelist is, is Monica Hill, uh, Vice President of Communications and Community Affairs for Nielsen Media Research, the world's leading television ratings company. In this role, she's worked extensively with news media, elected officials, and community leaders. Monica manages Nielsen's National Hispanic Latino Strategic Community Outreach and the company's California Government and Community Affairs Program. Prior to join, joining Nielsen, Monica served as senior member of Antonio Villaraigosa's 2001 LA Mayoral campaign team and in 2005 was part of his historic victory. 
She's also served as press secretary for the Speaker of the California State Assembly, where she conducted media outreach efforts and organized citywide awareness events. Monica is also director of public affairs and community outreach for Los Angeles de la Mundo stations KVEA and KWHY, where she managed corporate giving for de la Mundo and served as principal liaison for community outreach in the LA area. Monica is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, where she received a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and a minor in Spanish. She received her master's degree in public policy from the USC School of Administration, and she serves on the board of the Salvadoran Leadership and Educational Fund. Please help me give a warm welcome to Ms. Monica Hill. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I looked over at Alex and I said, mild attack, only mild. But it really isn't. This is the way that um, him and I have been able to work together. And to answer his question about where we won, um, yes, there is a $50 million commitment. But I think more importantly also is I got a job. And the reason I say this is because it's very important when Nielsen hired me that I came in and that it was not just a position that was um, not going to have direct access or influence. I have to say Nielsen's been very good about ensuring that I have direct access to the CEO. And I think that's a big thing when you're in a company that is embracing diversity. Uh, we have to get positions at executive levels which are allowing us to have access. So uh, I do applaud Nielsen for that effort. I think it makes a difference in all of the work that we do. So who are we? We are Nielsen Media Research. We are the company that measures uh, what you watch on television. You know, the ones that say there are 91 million viewers watching the Super Bowl. Well, that's us. We measure what you watch, when you watch it, and where you watch it. But don't worry, we don't tell your wives or anything like that. It's all confidential. Um, and we ask, you, you, many times I go around the country and people ask me, well, why should I care? And I look at them straight in the eye and say, because there's a $75 billion advertising industry. Latinos purchasing power is $860 billion. You know what? We deserve to get a little piece of that pie. And it's really important that people understand the ratings game and what's at stake. And I say this because being at Nielsen, we understand the importance of making sure that our measurement samples are accurate and that they're correct. So I welcome the opportunity to enhance our samples at any time. We're in the business of truth. If we don't get these samples right, then we're doing a disservice. And there's too many dollars at stake for us not to get it right. Um, but there's a lot of challenges when you're measuring the Latinos community, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Currently, Latinos represent 11% of the TV households in the entire country, of which 72% of them are of Mexican origin. 66% are foreign-born, and that's actually down from 2005, which was at 75% in terms of the foreign-born population. I mentioned earlier that we are in the business of truth. Measuring Latinos is very tough, guys. You guys know it. Um, we are hard, complex. You have the Puerto Rican in New York, the Mexicano, Mexican American in Los Angeles, the Cuban in Florida. You got all the accents going everywhere. We have to make sure we get people who are representative of the communities going out to recruit the households. Um, you also, we need to make sure that when we're selecting the households that we are sending people who can communicate with the household and we're getting that information. Um, I know here's where I normally get the question that says, well, I don't know anybody who's a Nielsen household. I know many of you guys are thinking that right now. Let me tell you, we like it that way. We don't want you guys to know because it's important that we keep this information confidential. Imagine if I was, I'll pick on ABC since ABC is the sponsor. Imagine if I was ABC and I knew where a Nielsen box is. They can probably give better incentives than I can. Uh, so we want to make sure that nobody knows where these boxes are, that it's very confidential, so that um, there is no way that we can in any way skew the sample, and maybe they're watching more ABC than they would be watching NBC or Univision or Telemundo, what have you. So we're very careful about keeping that information confidential. We are a sample. We're uh, like a blood sample. Think of it that way. When you go to the doctor, you're not going to ask her to drain your blood, all your blood. You're going to ask her to take a little bit so that we can get a sample of what your type is. And that's kind of the way I see it. Or if you have a big bowl of soup and, you know, you put the, the spoon in, you get a little bit of carrots, you get a little bit of celery, you get a little bit of everything. Um, and that's what we do. We're in the business of statistics and science. Uh, we measure in two ways. We have people meters. And I brought one with me to show you. 
So, and I'm picking on Bob just because he's up front. This is the box. <laughs> this is the box that we use to measure. Uh, this is the people meter box. And we put this, we wire up all the households. We go into, so if you have five TV sets, this is connected to all of your TV sets. And it, this one has up to 16. The normal box has eight. But because Latino households are bigger, we decided to make one for 16 so that everybody can log in. And we can log in any visitors that are coming in. Um, to make sure that we have an accurate measurement. And in this box, let's say you are number one. Something tells me you're number one in your household. Um, you will be assigned the number one. And when you come in, just like a remote, you just log in, you push the button, turn on the TV, push the button, you're number one. And this box already has all the information. This has already told me that Bob is between 18 to 34 years old of age. So we have that demo already in place, and we're able to, every time he logs in, know that the 18 to 34-year-old male, Hispanic male, is watching um, football or what have you. We're able to take all that information with us. We send this, this data is immediately reported back to our um, facilities in Oldsmar, Florida, and all that information is gathered and we're able to produce the ratings for that evening. The second way that we measure is through a diary system. This is in our top 10 markets and it's um, going to be uh, expanded to our top 25 markets. And this is a diary here that we have. This diary, and you guys can come, we're welcome to come and look at it afterwards. This diary is able to measure uh, what you watch, but you have to write it in. So it's kind of more based by memory. Um, and what we do in this diary is every 15 minutes you're supposed to record exactly what you're watching on TV. So we still have this in uh, 56 markets. And one of the things that we're going to be doing by 2011 is we're going to go all electronic. So we're creating different devices right now that will allow for us to measure differently. You know, we're looking at a mailable meter. Um, so different types of, of things that will make it easier for everybody instead of having to write it all in. And that's something that you guys should be watching out for. OK, so um, you know, the, one of the things that I want to say about how we measure Latinos is it, it is very difficult to recruit Latino households. Our studies have indicated that Latino households and African American and Asian American households are much harder to recruit than the general market uh, households. And there's a lot of reasons that we have, a lot of things that we have to take into account when we're measuring these. First of all, you have to get the households to agree. So we can't ask any questions that are going to reduce cooperation rates. Um, the question of whether or not we ask whether they are US born or foreign born has come up quite a bit. We're looking at that as a possibility, but we want to make sure that when you ask the question, you don't reduce the cooperation rates. And that's very important to Nielsen. We wire the devices, all the households in the, um, in, in the all, I'm sorry, all the TVs in the household need to get wired, DVRs, VCRs, uh, video games, we're able to measure all of that. We have to train the families how to use this box. Um, and we have a coaching system, and we, if they don't have a phone, we install a phone for them, and we're able to make sure that they know how to use this, this box so, you know, so, we can, so that we can measure if it's faulting and if something's going wrong. Um, we give incentives. Clearly, they can't be incentives that are going to be altering their viewing habits. So I can't buy them a big old TV and then they're watching more TV. No, we can't do that. Uh, but we can give them incentives that will hopefully make them feel that they want to participate in the system. It's kind of like it, when we go out to reach them, it's kind of like phone banking. We have to understand the cultural nuances and the language preferences. When you're calling uh, for phone banking, you'll know if they're Republicans, Democrats, most likely voters. Uh, first-time voters. In the same sense, we have to have all this information when we go in. So now you know our business, and I got the one-minute sign, so I'm going to just quickly go through this. What are Latinos watching on TV? Uh, do you guys have a sheet in front of you? I believe you do. Let me first give you some general ca characteristics. First of all, I just have to say, Nielsen does not make programming decisions. Uh, we are in the business of producing the data, and we allow the networks to make the programming decisions on their own. Um, but some general characteristics are Latino households are generally larger. We have more children in our households. We do have less cable penetration. We're at about 76%. It's 10% higher in the general market. Can anyone guess how many hours of TV a Latino household is watching a day? Felix. <laughs> uh, eight. Eight hours and 42 minutes a day. The average individual in the household is watching three hours and 58 minutes of television per day. We have 2.55 TV sets in most of our households. 
We like VCRs, but we're only at 70%. 43% of the Latino households for the 18 and 49 uh, coveted demo demographic that advertisers are looking for are watching Spanish. 57% are watching English. Children and teens watch less Spanish. And does anyone know the city with the highest Spanish dominant population? Miami. Miami is the highest, and then followed by New York. So there's many ways to look at it. I'm going to let you guys look at the, the handouts I gave out. This is what Latinos are watching. Um, clearly, and it, it's not because ABC is the sponsor, but this past, for this week, they were able to uh, get the top six out of the, the ten shows that were watching uh, Latino that are watching television, uh, Hispanics are watching ABC. Uh, clearly, they're very much into Sunday night football. That's a big issue, a big uh, program for them. For Spanish language TV, telenovelas obviously do well. The Latin Grammys did well. Cable's not here, but they're all watching Chavo del Ocho. It was, it was, it, Galavision did very well in Chavo del Ocho. And for elections, and I'll end with this, for elections, um, they did tend to watch election coverage on ABC. You don't have that handout. And there's, that had the highest percentage for Latinos, but it, it was followed by CBS. That could be for a number of different reasons. I'm looking here. ABC had a 90-minute show versus 60-minute shows. It aired a little bit longer, and it aired a little bit earlier. So there's a lot of different reasons for that. When you look at ratings, there's so much that is involved in terms of what it's competing with that night or what have you. But I welcome the questions, and I hope you have a quick snapshot of our industry. I welcome the challenges, and I welcome your questions. Gracias. joined today by Philip Rodriguez, Senior Fellow for Documentary Filmmaking at the Institute for Justice and Journalism at the USC Annenberg School of Communication, which is quite a mouthful, I guess. I hope that's not on his card. Um, he's also the founder of City Projects, an organization dedicated to creating sustainable programs that both educate and entertain today's diverse audiences. Philip is currently at work on Brown is a New Green, a one-hour documentary for PBS on Hispanic marketing and media featuring comedian George Lopez. His most recent PBS high-definition uh, documentary first aired on PBS Independent Lens Series in November 2004, where it garnered the series' highest ratings. Los Angeles now investigates the browning of America's second largest city. The film has been honored by New York Anthology Film Archives, Boston Fine Arts Museum, Input 2005, and Harvard Film Archives, among others. Phillips production company, City Projects, recently conducted My City Now, an interactive media literacy program for high school students in U.S. cities impacted by high rates of immigration. A graduate of USC Berkeley, Rodriguez is an MA in Latin American Studies and an MFA in Film and Television from UCLA. He's a former Senior Research Fellow for the Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University. Please welcome Mr. Philip Rodriguez. As David just mentioned, uh, I think what's really interesting, we, we can all celebrate this notion that uh, we have Latinos on TV, uh, and that's terrific. But we have such a long way to go. We have few authors, few writers, few directors, few people that are genuinely forming uh, an organic, honest portrayal of Latino life in media. And uh, so um, I took on this documentary as a way, it's a PBS documentary paid for by the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, as a way of examining how this culture might be introduced into the American mainstream. George Lopez is a very rare figure insofar as that his name is on, he's a, he's a Mexican American a self-described Chicano, and his name is on this ABC sitcom that he has a great deal to say about. And uh, so what we did is follow him around in his day-to-day -day activities and see how he's balancing his need to appeal to mainstream English language audiences and also maintain some kind of authentic portrayal of his own experience. And how this Latino phenomenon is being sold to people, and particularly young Latinos. And what will be the impact of this commercial culture on this nascent American identity? So, I, that's it for me.
Thank you, Philip. That was excellent. We do have a few minutes for question and answers. We're running a little bit late, but we do, uh, for anyone that does have a question, if you can please come up to the microphone and, and please ask uh, Philip, Monica, or Alex a question. Thank you. To measure the community and how effective that is, and, and I know that, that Nielsen's mandate is to go ahead and measure the audience and its composition. One of the problems that I continue to have is that they're spending $50 million to go ahead and better the system. Um, and, and you can well imagine their, their system for measuring Hispanics has now been in play for almost uh, 20 years. Um, and you can imagine, the, in terms of advertising dollars, the number of dollars that have been lost to Hispanics to go ahead and provide opportunity. The reason there aren't writers, the reason there aren't actors, is because people couldn't make a living that way. And uh, I guess my question is, is that of the $50 million, how much of it is going to be earmarked at, uh, at Latinos? And the second question is, is that uh, how will we know? Are there benchmarks to know whether this has been effective or not been effective in terms of measuring uh, the, the Hispanic community? And uh, one last question with respect to, to people meters. Um, how do we know it's being effective with respect to monolingual Hispanics? Basically, uh, from the perspective that 66% of the people that you're measuring are foreign born. I can tell you this, though. Um, specifically for the audience that you're looking, we have made some very targeted efforts. We know that, that the Spanish dominant male is the hardest to recruit. So we're currently running a test in Los Angeles and one in New York to increase incentives for Hispanic dominant males to make sure that we can recruit them. And as a matter of fact, Latino communities have the largest incentive of all of our audiences because they're the hardest to recruit. That's one, I think that's important. We're ensuring that the representatives, when you're going out to recruit, are speaking in language. We're ensuring that there's a coaching system. Uh, so there has been some, a lot of our community outreach efforts have increased, as you've noticed, because we're trying to make sure that we are uh, making people understand our brand. One of the challenges we have is Latinos don't know our brand. And that is one of the things that we face. We've placed advertising dollars to ensure that uh, on radio we can't do TV, so we have to do radio and print. So there are a lot of challenges in terms of increasing our brand. In terms of the local people meters and what you asked, um, these people meters f have been shown, have, when we give the training that's necessary, we do show that Latinos are watching everything and that the Hispanic are represented, especially the Spanish dominant. I made that 60% number. All of that is based on the, on the, our UEs are based on the census, as you know. So we have that as our threshold in terms of our universe estimates. Normally, in all of our markets, our Hispanic Latino thresholds are higher than, they, than what the census is saying. I don't know if that answered your question. You threw three questions at me. Anything else? You know what, we don't announce them, but I can tell you this, because they are not going to be higher than what the IRS allows us to give them, because then they have to report it as income. So they won't be that high. They're not high. You know, you kind of have to see it as when people go out and vote. In the general market, you know, you can make an appointment to make a Nielsen uh, visit. In Latino households, you can't. You have to educate the community of who we are, and that's where we're relying on everyone here to help people understand the importance of the ratings. And when you get a knock on your door saying that it's a Nielsen household, yes, get the people to say yes, because if we don't, they're not going to be, it's going to be hard to recruit. All of, our, all of our trainers, all of our recruitment materials, they're in Spanish. That's one of the changes that took place. We're making sure that everything is in Spanish and English. All the letters that go out, we send a prepack. So before I get to your household, I already have a sense, because I've sent you some information, to know if you're going to be Spanish dominant or English dominant. Our interviewers are absolutely uh, bilingual. They speak the language. I'm currently in the works of working with the William C. Velasquez Institute to make sure that they're looking at our hiring techniques. So what we're doing specifically is if we are hiring uh, bilinguals, but not just bilingual, bicultural, so they can get the cultural nuances. Right, Thank you very much for a delightful panel. My question is directed to Alex. My name is Manny Medrano. I'm a network correspondent with ABC News, and it's my privilege to be the first Latino in the history of the U.S. Supreme Court Press Corps which is startling to me in this day and age. But the question I had for you, Alex, is this. You can probably count on two hands the total number of network correspondents, Latinos and Latinas, in the United States, the network level. What can we do to rectify that? Because 
that's an atrocious track record, I think. Well, you know, the journalists are very upset at Univision right now because they're going to be closing down seven <coughs> city uh, newsrooms. <coughs> They're doing it, of course, to save money, as everybody is, is, is trying to do these days. But you can't really pick on just one because they're all doing it. Uh, so th that's a problem that has to be ironed out. But what can we do? And that is do the same type of pressure on the news part of their operations as we have been using in the entertainment part. I didn't quite say the whole story in terms of the numbers of people in front and in back of camera in network television. The numbers really are high. From ABC having two regulars, they now have 19. I mean, excuse me the indiscretion, Bob, but it's that drastic. Now that's only regulars. If you start counting the people that are coming in as guests and so forth, the numbers are just huge. Now, as someone else pointed out, the numbers are still below where we should be. We need to apply the same tactics that we have applied to the entertainment part, to the news part. The, the door has been open, especially at ABC, to do precisely that. But you know, it all takes resources. It takes people, it takes the money to fly back and forth, to have those meetings, to follow up and follow up and follow up. It's all about follow up. We haven't done that. So it's not that we don't want to, it's just that we have been occupied with so many different things. But I am in touch with the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and we're going to be working on this because look, <clears throat> it isn't just about having our stories told, it isn't just about having our people involved, it's also about the news. Because the news are shaped not only in front of camera but also behind camera. So we're very cognizant of the fact that you must be on the assignment desk, that you must be the newsroom directors, that you must be the guy reporting this or that, because many a time you generate your own stories anyway. So in answer to your question, we're going to have to do that, and we know very well that we have to do it this year. I just came from a meeting where, in fact, I'm proposing something. It's going to cost a lot of money, but at a certain point, another course. Uh, my name is Alberto Avendaño. I'm the associate publisher with El Tiempo Latino, which is the Spanish language publication of the Washington Post. And my, my question is, what is your view about me? Meaning uh, CBS buys Hispanic radios, NBC buys Telemundo, uh, uh, a lot of uh, traditional Anglo media corporations are getting into this market through publications like mine. What is your view about that? You. Um, you know, well, we believe in making sure that advertisement dollars are going into publications, but I can't do anything other than TV and ra than a radio and print. Um, what we've done for our spending is we focused it on our on our people meter markets because that's where we needed the most help at, and we currently need to consider um, our LPM markets. So we won't be doing um, Washington until we have another outreach effort here in terms of print. You know, like everything, there's limited dollars, so we're going to target it to the areas that we currently need it, but we're, we're firm believers of it. Your publication is Spanish language, is that correct? Yes. All right, you're getting screwed and you know it. You know, the advertising dollars that are being put out there for the Latino market don't pay much attention to Spanish language print. That's just a fact. So what can we do about it? You know, we, we have to go preach to the choir. I think that the large, large corporations know that they want to reach the Latino, especially the Spanish language Latino. But you know, it, they want to do it a la cheap. They want to put 10 cents and have it go all the way. So they're starving you. And that's a problem we have always had. What we can do is what I sa said to Manny a, a moment ago, put pressure on them because that's the only thing that's going to work. You want our business, you want Latinos to come and buy your product, then pay the price. You know, it is like Spanish language television, the same identical thing. They're not getting 100 cents on the dollar. They're lucky if they're getting 60 cents on they the dollar. They get 3% of the ad dollars. How much? 3% of the ad dollars. So that's 75 billion. They get 3%. Cable Imag gets 0.1. Imag Imaginate. So it's the same type of pressure that we have to apply. But like everything else, how many hands do you have? How many allies do you have? Um, frankly, this is not one that I'm that is a big priority for me at this point, and only because we have these others that we've been working for a while, and the one that Manny was, was talking about, we understand we have to go and do that. Um, doesn't mean I'm not sympathetic, 
it doesn't mean that I don't want to help. If you can find a way that we can help you, please, by all means, you know, let me know. Uh, if it doesn't take a lot of resources, a lot of time, more than willing to do it. At a certain point, we're going to have to pay more attention to it, and I know it. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're all out of time. But I'd like to thank our panelists, Philip, Monica, and Alex, for coming today. And I'd also like to thank Norelli Garcia, who's the director of the Issue Hour, for putting us all together. <laughs>